Good morning. Two weeks ago, I called a friend down south. We usually talk annually, but what with one thing and another, it had been two years. I've, I've known her since high school, and those long relationships become more precious to me every year of my life. When I asked how she was, which in this year has become not just a polite inquiry, she said, fine, not up to pre-COVID letters, levels, but, but better than I've been. I asked what was different between now and then, and she just said, isolation. We shared our stories about the pandemic and everything else. We even edged up to our views on politics. So that wasn't why I called. I just needed to maintain our connection. Last week in a Zoom call with three college friends from all over, really, we spent half our time discussing the levels of risk that we could tolerate as our states and cities opened up? Would we eat inside a restaurant? Would we entertain unvaccinated friends or be entertained by them? Take a plane or a train or a subway? Go to the theater? What had we already done and what would we consider? Well, I know more people in the States who are grappling with these risks of reentry than I do in Canada, just because Ontario has remained pretty closed until this past week. Peter and I are particularly closed because we won't finish isolation quarantine until Tuesday, two weeks after we cross the border. But I, I've begun to hear similar concerns here. People are thinking about where and how they will connect with their networks. Their pandemic story changed the size and shape of those networks. We're all experiencing PTSD even before we threw with the trauma. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'd just like to point out that the prophet Ezekiel also speaks to us from a place of trauma. The Babylonian exile was Israel's defining trauma. It began while he was a young man training for priestly service. He was among the political and religious leaders who were deported across the desert to Babylon. They left Jerusalem and the temple in a pile of rubble and Judah's religious, political, and social structures were devastated. So Ezekiel's encounter with God that Priscilla describes occurs 1,700 miles from home. He's unmoored from his life's work because he wasn't trained to serve as a priest just anywhere. It didn't work that way. He and his family were designated for the temple at Jerusalem. And there just wasn't any other place like that place to serve God. He had to have been both physically and emotionally exhausted. I imagine him still trying to figure out what he's supposed to do with himself when he has a vision of the Lord that literally flattens him, it knocks him on his face. And then God says to him, stand up so I can talk to you. I flashed on the number of times I've thought that just getting up to answer the doorbell might take more energy than I could manage. I imagined Ezekiel laboriously hauling himself up. But as it turned out, no struggle was required. At the sound of God's voice, he says, 
a spirit entered into him. Spirit, ruach in Hebrew, pneumos in Greek. Ruach is the breath in our bodies that gives us life. It is also the spirit of God that hovered over the waters of creation, that entered into the prophets and demanded that they speak, that descended from heaven at Jesus' baptism, and that blew through the upper room at Pentecost. Ruach pulled Ezekiel up to his feet, listening. And what he heard was, you go speak for me to my people. They might or might not listen. They may or may not understand. And they probably won't like what you say. But you let them know that I have not lost interest in them or abandoned them. And they can be sure of that because I am still speaking to them. That's what prophets do. They speak for God. And so the spirit carried Ezekiel to work. In our gospel text, the spirit of God was still hard at work. Jesus has just come from what could be described as a very successful tour in the Galilee hill country. Mark says that he exercised a host of demons from a man whom they tormented for years, healed a hemorrhaging woman, and brought the daughter of a synagogue leader back to life. Word was getting around and people were getting excited. Then he came to his hometown. Was Nazareth just on his route? Or did he expect to reconnect with family and neighbors in the place where he grew up? Maybe he just wanted to take a deep breath and sit down for a day or two. We don't know. Our assumptions, uh, sorry, our assumptions reflect how we perceive Jesus of Nazareth as human or divine or both. His inextricably intertwined humanity and divinity is a foundation of my own relationship with Jesus. It's when I first glimpsed his humanity that his divinity really had any meaning for me. I could, I could believe he really understood my prayers only when I believed he had walked where I have walked and gone there before me. But this, did, this visit didn't work out very well. Of course, he taught in the synagogue. Jesus taught from the very beginning of his ministry, even before he was finished calling all his disciples. So that's, that's what he would do at home. And at first, people were impressed by his wisdom. But then suspicion soured their mood. They, they just couldn't connect the Jesus who'd grown up there and practiced his trade among them with the man whose spiritual authority was the talk of Galilee and on display in their synagogue. It didn't fit with anything they knew about the way the world works. After all, they knew his whole family. And his brothers and sisters and mother didn't seem to think they were now anything special. So here Jesus was upending the natural order of things. Just exactly where did he get off? Who made him a leader? The exchange after that got downright snarky because Jesus didn't back down for a moment. 
His famous riposte sounded pretty rude. It laid the whole problem with his friends and family. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own home. So not only is it his fault, but so now he's claiming to be a prophet, speaking for God. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that their response confounded him because Jesus was not very often confounded. He had dealt handily time and again with the Pharisees who were lawyers and wanted to catch him out with complicated arguments about the law. But Mark says that he was so amazed by the lack of faith he encountered there in Nazareth that his work was limited to healing just a few people. Perhaps those people were, like the woman with the flow of blood, open to his authority based on need and hope. Like her, they might not think they had Jesus figured out, but they were convinced they needed his help. Well, discouraged or not, Jesus didn't stop. He left with his disciples to continue his ministry. And what's more, he took it to the next level. He knows what he can do. He also knows that his disciples are supposed to carry on after him. That means that not only does he have to know that they can do the work, but they have to know that they can do the work. So he sends them out to do what he does. Preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, and free people from their demons. He shares his spiritual power for, with them for this mission, but tells them to take nothing else. Travel light, he says. Stay where they'll have you. If nobody will have you and nobody listens to the word of God, don't argue. Just move on. I wonder, as he watched the pairs of disciples leave, was Jesus serenely confident that they could do the work? They appear to have accepted the mission without question or argument. But would their faith in him instill faith in others? Could they exercise spiritual power? If you see Jesus as only divine, you might reasonably assume he foresaw the, sec the success of this expedition. His encounter with his neighbors hadn't shaken his confidence in himself. And he knew the caliber of his followers. So perhaps any uncertainty would be all on their side. But I feel closer to Jesus when I think of him as this man of power who was willing to take a risk. These disciples hadn't finished their travels with Jesus. They didn't understand his warnings of the crucifixion, nor would they perform very well when he was arrested and killed. They ran away and hid. But at this particular point, they didn't shrink from the task. Loyal commitment helped them carry this strange load into strange territory. And it worked. I wonder if later, maybe after Pentecost, let's say that, they felt the Spirit's presence and remembered this mission. I wonder if they said to themselves, having regathered 
recovered from their fear and said to each other, yeah, we got this. We can speak for God. And they did. They were laughed at and run out of town and jailed. Some of them were killed. But they also preached, taught, served, healed, and encouraged in the best way they knew how. And in doing so, they laid the foundations of Christ's church. So now I'm thinking of our future as a congregation and as the church. Here we are, hopeful, excited, fearful, and conflicted. We're sick of Zooming. We're anxious about being indoors with too many people and they keep changing the rules about how many is too many. We don't know for sure when or how we can sing together. Some of us wonder if or how we can bring the church at large into the sanctuary and yet maintain the intimacy of the community we form in the sanctuary. It seems like a lot. But I think we need to continue looking for the particular ways each of us can carry the church forward. We need to keep listening to each other's stories and telling our own because that's what it takes to get our strength back. In small groups, in pairs, on our own, we need to encourage each other because that invokes the spirit among us. We could also seek out the Holy Spirit. I can't tell anyone how to pray, but I can say that last year, it made me very anxious that I couldn't get back home to New York City, which may seem strange. Here you are, here you all were, with sirens and death all around you. And I was, by comparison, much safer in Peter's house in Ottawa. But when they closed the border, I felt trapped in exile. I can't tell you when I started speaking directly to the spirit in my prayers. I found that I could ask her to transform me into someone I just could not be on my own. Maybe it was just that I asked the question or because I was acknowledging my limits. Whatever, I could feel a presence and receive a peace that let me take a deep breath and calm down. There you are, ruach, all over again. I think the Holy Spirit is reaching for each and all of us. We need all of us because we need to keep doing the work you have already started. This congregation already knows that there are too many people for whom the 4th of July is not a real good reason to celebrate. Too many people are living on the margin who need to be brought into community. So even though we don't exactly know how to come together and move forward, I, I think, I believe that if we pay attention, the spirit will shine a light for our next step. She'll accompany us on familiar, on unfamiliar pathways. She'll pull us up on our feet and give us new words so that we can show that God is indeed still speaking. 
hey, West End, I'm new to the game. But with God's help, I really think we got this. Amen. Um,